Good morning, everyone. So happy you're here. Let's stand up and let's praise the Lord. Let's get excited. We have so much to be thankful for. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley.
experienced darkness in our lives, right? We've all experienced the depths. We've all experienced fear, anxiety. But there's one name that is greater than all of that, and that is Jesus. And I want you guys to remember that as we sing this next song. No matter what your darkness is or what your valley is, Jesus is greater than that. His name is greater than that. Jesus shines in the darkness. His name shines in depression, in anxiety, in addiction. Whatever you're experiencing, Jesus is greater. Whatever your family is experiencing, Jesus is greater than that. And I want you to remember that. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. being worthy of our praise, Lord. Thank you so much for calling us, calling our hearts to you, chasing us down when we were lost. God, thank you so much for having a powerful name that shines through the darkness. Lord, thank you. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. attending Capital City Church since I was a toddler. When I was five years old, I asked my mom if I could be baptized. I didn't want to wait till I was older. I knew I loved Jesus, but now that I am older, I understand more what it takes to live fully with Jesus. Having Jesus in my life makes me feel happier. I'm, I'm making better decisions by following him. I want to thank my mom, grandma, and my Sunday school teacher, Miss Marty, for helping me learn about Jesus, who he is, and what he has sacrificed for us all. Hello, my name is Marty Thompson, and I'd like to introduce you to Mason Eloy. Mason is the son of Deanna and Keith, and I have the privilege of having him in my fifth grade Sunday school class. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. Um, and so Mason is here today to proclaim his faith in Jesus. And so Mason, I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? And are you ready to make him the Lord and savior of your life? Okay, in light of this admission of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me introduce you to Vanessa. Vanessa, every part of her life is filled with passion. And everything that she does, she does as, at 100 miles an hour. She gets a lot done during the day. And I loved when she filled out her baptism paper. She's like, I get it. I get it. I want to serve Jesus. I want to save. I want him to be Lord and Savior of, of my life. So Vanessa. Have you made Jesus Lord and Savior of your life? Yeah. And by that confession, because of a step of obedience, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Ray, raised 
to new life through Jesus Christ. And she, here we go. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about Rory. These two best friends, they have gone to CIY. They know what it is to come and to step out in faith, to live by faith. This is an amazingly caring and compassionate soul. And your parents and your grandparents have prayed. They have spoke the name of Jesus over you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living Lord, and have you made him Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Because of that, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in new life. Here we go. How exciting is it ever to witness this, guys? I think it's so fun. It's so awesome. So the next song we're going to sing is very celebratory because we get to celebrate these new souls that get to join us in heaven. So let's stand and let's get excited. in a place to hide this weary soul this bag of bones and I tried with all my might but I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting a bag of bones and just when
morning, church. Praise God, three baptisms, they are free, free indeed. Uh, if we don't know each other, I'm Warren Rogers. I serve as one of the elders here at Keppel City. And uh, if you want to take your communion elements and prepare them, uh, we're entering a time where we remember not only who Jesus is, but what he did for us. So uh, I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 11 and then from Romans 5. Uh, but if you want to prepare your elements real quick. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're called to remember. Remember is not think fondly on something that's happened in the past, but it's to put back together and try to understand what's been done. And this is Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be justified and saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life. Church, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us, for pursuing us. When we were powerless, you owed us nothing. We were far from you. We were your enemies. And still, you pursued us. You said you loved us. You sent your son to take our place so that we could be reconciled to you, so that we could be not only in your presence, but part of your family. God, may we take this in and hold it dear that you loved us enough to pursue us even when we didn't want you. God, may we show that love to those around us because of the love you showed us. Amen. If those with the offering trays would uh, bring them forward at this time and go ahead and pass them, I want to take um, this time of offering to say thank you, church. Um, you are just so very generous with your time, your talents, your treasures. We support a lot of things through your sacrifice and your generosity. Missions, uh, the book pack, or <laughs> book bag program, uh, 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 Operation Christmas Child. Um, there's the clothing exchange and, and even Gather and Grow. And so uh, I'm going to ask uh, Aaron Guthrie, another elder, to come over here and talk with me about what your generosity has done, not only for the church, but for how we can interact and grow together. So Aaron, if, if you don't mind, just kind of talk us through what does Gather and Grow mean? What does what does the generosity of this church body have to do with how and where and why we worship? Yeah. Thanks, Warren. Um, yeah, again, my name's Aaron Guthrie, and I'm, I serve as one of the elders here at Capital City. Um, and I know we've been talking about Gather and Grow. We've been talking about a renovation for, for a while. Um, maybe for too long? <laughs> no. Just enough time. It feels like we are, we're getting very near to the, to the go, um, to the point where We'll be, um, I guess, closing down the worship center during the renovation time. So just wanted to kind of back up and, I guess, remind us of the, of the what and the why and the how we're accomplishing this. So um, first of all, I guess the what is we are we're renovating the worship center. And what that means is we're talking about all new uh, audio and video package. 
We're talking about um, all new seating. We're talking about carpet and paint. And um, there's gonna be some, I guess, some light structural um, updates that we're doing, but nothing too in depth there. But um, that's kind of the what. So as far as the, the, the why behind um, why we're doing this, um, first of all, we are, we're in the newest of the worship centers um, here at Capital City Christian Church. And believe it or not, we're approaching 20 years in this space. So here in a couple of years, uh, we'll celebrate the 20th anniversary of this edition. So, um, but with that goes um, some aging technology. Um, even as you look at some of the chairs, um, you know, you're starting to notice probably some frays and some, some tears. Um, and we recognize that we won't be able to um, update both spaces at the same time. So this one's 2006, that one over there is 1992. Um, if you haven't seen that space, if you normally attend this service and haven't had an opportunity to see that space, I would just invite you to step over there um, after service, just follow the 1992 blue carpet on around the, the grand staircase and, and go check it out. It's a beautiful space, it really is. Um, so we want to be uh, committed to investing in one space in a quality way instead of trying to update two spaces in kind of a in kind of a half measured way. Um, so, um, and I guess one of the other benefits that goes along with that, um, I always want to be careful about um, suggesting any kind of unity because we change a space or because we change um, any any parts of what we're doing here in the building. Um, unity comes through Christ, right? But having all of our uh, all of our congregation in the same common space. Um, it just feels like the right thing to do. Um, so um, that's kind of a little bit about the why. Um, just to, to remind us of some of the how. Um, so first of all, the financing has come um, partially through uh, a land sale. So we have along, we're not sure if it's 83rd Street, 81st Street, or 80th Street, but it's at the bottom of the hill. Um, and it's just a strip of land at the bottom of the hill. There is some property that we were able to sell there to generate about $360,000. Um, we have um, some church savings that we're going to be utilizing for this effort. So, and I just want to take a, a pause to, to be thankful to God that we have savings that we can utilize for, for stuff like this. Um, and then lastly, um, and most importantly, kind of the biggest piece of the pie is through God's generosity through, uh, through you, through the church, and how you've provided through the Gather and Grow campaign. Um, that's really, um, I guess, sort of the, the how we're financing it. Um, I do also want to, to mention that, I guess like any renovation or remodel project that you might have at home, it's never quite as inexpensive as what you hope that it will be. Um, so we've had a couple of uh, extra things that have come up that have kind of pushed us to the point where we're going to be able to do a very a quality job in the worship center, but we also hoped initially to be able to get to like the common areas and um, like so the perimeter go around, excuse me, uh, the perimeter hallways that go around the worship center and kind of the, the foyer area as you enter into that space. Um, we're not sure that for the original budget of the 1.2, we don't think we're going to be able to make it into the spaces. So um, we just, I guess, invite you um, as you're led, if you're led. Um, I know that a lot of you have committed to gather and grow. Um, and if you are, God leads you to, um, to give above and beyond what you had originally committed, or if you're newer, to this, to, to Capital City Christian Church, and um, you would like to get involved, um, it is not too late. Um, we have uh, also committed that we wanted to not exceed um, the budget. We didn't want to go into debt to accomplish any of the work that we're doing. So um, as the, uh, the resources are available, uh, we will utilize them. Um, if you haven't given before, then um, if you should choose to give, then just make sure that you earmark um, your check, or if you're giving online, just make sure that you earmark it, gather and grow, so that we can get those resources allocated properly. Thank you. And uh, just for everybody, if there are additional questions, comments, concerns, where can they go? How can they get those answered? Um, there was a uh, there was communication that was sent out um, this past Wednesday. So it included a few details, some timelines, um, et cetera. So, if you are guilty of overlooking that email like, like I was, um, then maybe go back and take a look for it. Otherwise, the same information is gonna be available on the church website that kind of outlines the same information. Um, elders, staff, um, John, I know that we would all be happy to, to answer any other questions that you might have beyond that. So just wanna say, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, church, yep.
Men of Capital City, you're invited to a men's breakfast on Saturday morning, April 27th at 8 a.m. You'll gather in the atrium to enjoy delicious food and fellowship while hearing an incredible testimony from our guest speaker, John Baker. Sign up at capitalcity.org and don't forget to invite a friend. Our mission of the month for April is Manhattan Christian College, where students are educated, equipped, and enriched to become Christian leaders. You can learn more about MCC at the Missions Kiosk or at our website, capitalcity.org. Are you ready for summer? Our children's and student ministries are. They have a ton of fun events planned for our kids. Summer camp, day camp, VBS, and more. You can see a brief list on the back of your Connect card and be sure to visit capitalcity.org summer for all the details and to get registered. That's it for the weekly update. Stay tuned next week for more. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Capital City Christian Church. If you're a family member or if you're a guest, if you're online, we want to say welcome. Thank you for being a part of this opportunity we have to, to worship Jesus, to have some spiritual conversations, to encourage one another. And guys, what a great morning. We just had three people take a step in their obedience and faith in Jesus Christ and get baptized. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> As a church body, I want to encourage you, when you see these people, give them a high five. Tell them congratulations. Ask them, how can I pray for you? We, as a family, are here for each other. Isn't that the beautiful thing about a church family? Like, we don't have to do this on our own. We don't have to live this life of faith on our own. We get to do this with one another. Yes, we may look a little different or speak a little different or enjoy a different uh, club or a sport or whatever, but with Christ here at Capital City, we, we're all one big, giant, dysfunctional family, and it's a beautiful thing. So I want you to find them and encourage them um, as you walk through uh, the atrium and the foyer this morning. We are continuing our, our, our series, uh, uh, external, f- Externally Focused, and that comes from the idea that um, individually and collectively as a church, our gravitational pull is to really search um, every opportunity we can find to take care of ourselves. And, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've never had to worry, I've never had to ask the question, John, are you hungry? Right? Every time I'm hungry, I go do some, something with it. I, I figure that stuff out, right? Um, I, I don't have to really worry about what's going on with my calendar. I have to make sure that I read it, but I'm the, you know, the champion of that calendar. I tend to, unless I'm intentional, worry about John Muffler. And I know that sounds like I'm a selfish person, because it is, right? And the vast majority of us as human beings are. We have the tendency to look inward and take care of ourselves. And as a church, we also have the tendencies. I've worked at a couple different churches. I've done a little bit of research. I'm sure you have any churches that you visited before. Unless there's intentionality, they're going to be focused on themselves. And it's wonderful, don't get me wrong, to be inward focused sometimes to create uh, worship services like this, Bible studies, opportunities uh, to, to minister to one another, to be to stand next to one another in Christian community. That is a beautiful thing. But here's the problem. If we are only focused on ourselves, we're really only living about half the life God has for us. So this morning and through this series, we're going to be looking at some scripture that is going to be calling us into both good news and good deeds. Because again, like we said last week, um, Jesus' ministry was all about both. It wasn't an or, it was an and. Where he, wa- uh, where he walked, he did good things to bring glory to the Father as he shared great news. And as Christians, we're called to do the very same thing in our communities, in our neighborhoods, um, at our work, uh, workplace. Like We are called to be people of both good news and good deeds. Now, let me give you a bad illustration to, to start this off. I like giving you uh, a word picture that way you can, you know, have something to talk about in the car. Uh, for 46 years, I have been, um, my diet and exercise routine is based on a fifth grader with a credit card. Okay? Um, I really, truly only eat things that come out of, like, a plastic wrapper um, I used to exercise in sports, and then I had all these kids, and I loved them dearly. And then I started sitting behind a desk all the time, and my life has changed. I have come to an understanding that I no longer have a body that is willing to put up with that kind of garbage. And so, my diet is slowly changing. Yes, I'm eating green things, not just Skittles. 
but eventually I'm going to eat some green things. Right, right, listen, there's, there's vegetables, there's fruit, there's other options besides things that come in a styrofoam container. And I'm leaning into that idea of I need to have a better diet. I need to have better quality of input into my life. But I understand and realize that if I change my diet and that's it, I'm not a healthier person. I might take steps to become a little healthier, but if there's only good in and no good out, I'm just changing some of my diet habits. Right? There has to be some exercise. John Muffler has to get on a treadmill. These soft theological hands have to push some iron, right? It's time. It's just time. Both good in and good out will help me become healthier human being. Church, wouldn't you agree with that? And it also matters in our spiritual lives. So many of us as individuals say, if I can just do one more Bible study, if I can just memorize a little bit more scripture, please, please hear the preachers not telling you not to read some Bible. Please tell, please hear it, please hear it. But here's the problem. We have a lot of positive input, but very little positive output. We are not living a healthy spiritual life that God has called us to. We could probably be even frustrated and understanding, like, man, I don't feel like I've been growing in my faith. There are so many disgruntled Christians that have been a part of church for decades that simply say, I don't feel like I'm growing. It must be the pastor's fault. And yeah, it's probably his fault too, right? But the reality is, the more good input you put in your body, which is great if you're not exercising your faith, if you're not utilizing what God has given us through scripture to fully understand the theological understanding of who God is and how we should live in this community, and we're not doing much about it, we are gonna be less healthy individuals. We're not maturing or growing in Christ. So this morning, I'm just gonna start throwing scripture at us and start asking the question, if we start serving, if we start doing these good deeds, will we grow? Can we have some spiritual maturity? In this life, can we really be a part of the purpose of what God has called us to be? So we're gonna start in 1 John 3:18. Dear children, dear children, I like how scripture is kind sometimes. Right, it like gives you a big hug, pats you on the back, and then it kicks you, right? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The Apostle John shares with us that our love must not be merely for show. And I bet you you've had somebody in your life where their love was just words. It was just for show, that when the troubles and the hard times come and you turn around to look for that person, they're gone because they had great words. They had great woo, right? The idea that it make you feel special and wonderful and warm and fuzzy, but really that's where it ended. And John is saying, we have to do more than just be great with our words. We can't just talk about love. We have to do something with it. We really have to do more than just talk a good love. Words matter, yet Christ did not come to simply share good theology. He served mankind at the same time. He served you and I by going to the cross and exchanging his righteousness for our brokenness and sin. He could have simply said, you should love God, have a great day, and then walk away. What did he do? He would come in with great news, doing great things to show off the goodness of God, to impress upon us that he loves us dearly. And so we respond to that. When we put our love into action, only then will it be love in truth, John says. This is what Peter says, and, and this is going to be difficult, but we're going to unpack it. Ready? Uh, this is what First Peter says. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? I love sarcasm, right? It's even in Scripture. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Peter gives us a little sarcasm with the statement, who will harm you? Guys, we live in this broken world. Every good deed is returned with some negativity, right? There are just times in life when we try to do something good, when we try to be the right person at the right time, and the world kicks us. We live in a broken and destroyed world where evil reigns. Church, have you tried to do the right thing and received nothing but, but anger and garbage and frustration? You've been there, right? When you've tried to do the right thing and the world kicks you. I love the sarcasm. So Peter simply says, it's going to happen. You know you're gonna do good. You're gonna be engaged in the community. You're going to be showing off the goodness of Christ through serving and doing good deeds for the kingdom of God. And there are going to be people that are gonna push back. And he says, this is the norm. 
For Christians in the early uh, first century, the norm was serving one another, serving their communities, and people pushing back and persecuting them. And so what does uh, Peter do? He says, don't, don't fear those outsiders. Keep doing what you need to be doing to worshiping Jesus. Don't be frightened because they can't separate you, church. They can't separate Christians from God. They can't take away the goodness of Christ and the mercy he brings by persecution or frustration. And so he gives us a, a list of things that we need to grab onto as we walk into our community, knowing that people might push back when we do good things. But in your hearts, he says, revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So here we go. He gives us a couple ideas of what we should do as we walk into the community doing good in case somebody pushes back. Number one, he says, revere Christ. We are to hold Jesus as the standard of behavior for our King and our Savior. The ultimate authority has freed us from sin. There are going to be people that don't like what we're doing. That authority is real, but not real enough to separate us from who Christ is. And so when he says that we should revere Christ, we should hold him at the center of our life. Every decision we make, every opportunity of love we make, we look at Christ and simply say, he's the biggest deal. What's the second one? Be prepared to share why your hope is in Christ. When we are doing good in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our families, people are going to take notice. They're going to ask questions. Why are you here? Why are you trying to do something nice for my family? Why are you showing up to this neighborhood and trying to be a positive uh, situation here? Because people have been burnt. They just don't trust anyone anymore. And so as Christians, when we walk into a situation and simply try to do good to bring glory to God, people are going to push back and say, what are you doing? What's your alternative motive? What's your angle? Because they don't trust. And so what our angle should be is simply a firm and resolute, because my Jesus saved me, I've been called to serve others. Because my King of Kings bled for me, I've been told to serve others. Because the hope that I have in Jesus Christ has compelled me, I'm going to come in to whatever the situation is and serve and be obedient to others. And then the last one he says, and this is kind of maybe the hard one, he says, through humility, share Christ in a way that draws outsiders in rather than pushing them away. And so as we do goods, we are there to bring glory to God and help people see the goodness of Jesus and draw them in instead of going in and being a positive example and telling everybody they're wrong. The morally they're, they're mistaken or they're rooting for the wrong team or the political party that they're following is just not the right idea, right? We are called to be in humility, gentleness, and respect interacting with people that need to be drawn into a loving arms of Jesus Christ. Listen, I get it. Many of us have struggled with interacting in our communities because we just feel less than. Many of us look in the mirror and simply say, I'm still broken. Yet, most of us as Christians have been redeemed on the inside. We look in the mirror and say, I'm still broken. I still have bad behaviors. And so why would I go do good things? People are just going to look at me and say, you call yourself a Christian, but you're still a broken human being. And you simply say, correct, I follow a perfect Jesus. Right? And so some of us are saying, since I'm still broken, I haven't gotten my act together, I can't serve others. Some of us say, listen, I'm unsure of the deep biblical truths I need to serve others. Yet, you have responded to the hope of the Savior. You're the greatest theologian you need to be to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. I'm not saying, stop reading your Bible. I am simply saying this. If you've accepted that Jesus has saved you from your sins and your life has changed because of that, go into your community and share that hope. And if you run into a question you don't get, Google it or come to us. We'd love to help you with some theology, right? So don't let this hold you back to say, listen, I'm not there yet. I'm not to the theological uh, aspect of where I can just answer everything and go into the community. And maybe the last one is simply that you're uneasy with those who do not look like you or act like you or vote like you. Yet Christ accepted you while you were still his enemy. Many of us look at the situation and simply say, I don't want to serve that person because I don't agree with that person. 
I don't want to do good things in that community because that community is, is about things that I don't like or appreciate or I disagree with or I vote in a different way. Church, isn't it a beautiful thing that you were not right with God and Jesus saved you? You did not come to his standard. And then he said, I'm going to send a savior. He sent a savior to the enemy, me. I was acting like an enemy of God. And he simply looked at me and said, yep, you need a savior. Isn't it a beautiful thing? that we don't have to look at anybody else and simply say you're not there yet because Jesus came to save us when we were not there yet. So I think there's some positives. I think through uh, good deeds, people have all kinds of opportunities to have their faith stretched. Isn't this a beautiful thing? Instead of just good input, we can have some great output. I think number one, whoop, number one, I think serving others gets us out of our comfort zones. Um, I live fairly close to church. Our kids go to Cahoe and Mickle and East. And so there's like a square of Northeast Lincoln that the mufflers normally hang out in. It's just kind of our comfort zone. It's where we know all the streets, we know all the food, we know exactly where we're going, we shop at Walmart to get our groceries, and we head home, take the dog out, right? It's, it's easy for us, it's comfortable. And then every once in a while, somebody asks me, and I gotta go south of O? Oh, it's strange, those are weird people, I don't get it, I'm kidding. Mainly, right? And every once in a while, I gotta go to Omaha or Grand Island, these people. What's going on there, right? Sometimes when we serve others, it compels us and pushes us out of our little comfort square. And when we are out of our comfort zone, we grow when we serve others and we do good things to others. Sometimes it gets us, it forces us right out of what makes us comfortable. Because you know what the great thing about your couch? It's comfortable. You can't serve anybody from there. Serving, other, serving others causes groups to bond in tighter relationships. Boy, I tell you what, I want to encourage you. Serve with your family, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your parents. It's a good time. Shared memories, shared stories. Hey, remember that one time that when dad fell over that? Yeah, it was awesome. It was so much fun, right? When you get out of your comfort zone and you share with your family or your community group or your small group or your Sunday school, whatever it is, that you're bound together tighter because of those mutual stories. And sometimes humans are braver when we do things with others. And so you're tighter with your group. You're tighter with your family. I think another opportunity to grow is serving others as a vehicle for evangelistic opportunities. When we serve others, when we place our needs second and put somebody else above our own, people ask questions. They're a little more open to understand why we do what we do. When we are called to love others instead of just loving ourselves, it is an easier conversation, and I very much believe the Holy Spirit pushes people's hearts into a softer position when we serve them, when we minister to them. And that's the last one. I think serving others provides goodwill in the community. Now, most of us are good Midwestern people. I'm not talking to you East Coast or West Coast people. Good for you. God bless you. I don't understand you. It makes me a little sad. I've had your pizza and I'm disturbed, right? But here in the Midwest, a part of the community is just being a nice neighbor. You see somebody with a flat tire, you stop. You don't be like, I'll pray for you, and you just drive by. No, you don't. You stop, and if you can't change that tire, then you call somebody that can, because that's my kid. Someday, very soon, with that flat tire on O. You encourage one another by being a positive neighbor. You worry and take care of the person next to you. And when we do that, I think there's opportunities for us to grow in our faith by just serving our neighbors. The church will have a better re reputation. Your family will have a better reputation of people of, that are just good neighbors in your community. Now, ministry or good deeds uh, is both for the mechanic as well as the minister, the teenager, as well as the tenured. We are all called to do good, no matter what mile marker you are on your faith journey with Jesus. One of my favorite illustrations of this is VBS. Every year, VBS is this, this rallying cry in this whole church. And I've been at other churches, the same thing. It's this rallying cry that says, everyone and anyone is going to serve next to each other. I've seen teenagers and youth and paired come together and serve. I've seen sweet little grandmothers, and I've seen junior high students serve side by side. I've seen people with different policies, politics, backgrounds, education, different tone of skin, different social economics coming together and serving one another. It is a beautiful picture. When we serve one another and get out of our own skin 
and to do something for other people, it really does allow us to grow. Now, Ephesians 2 says this. This is uh, a great opportunity for us to kind of see where God is, is pushing us. For it is by grace you have been saved through your good works. No, church, through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Church, isn't this a beautiful thing? You were not saved by good works, but we were certainly saved for good works. We are saved by a savior, and the only thing he calls us to do is have faith and trust in him. There is no level of, I've been to church this many times, I've had this many posts on social media about Jesus, I've read my Bible. There is no works that can put us in a situation that gets us right with God, but there is a savior that has come to us to free us, to set the captive free, and through that faith we are saved. Church, isn't that a beautiful thing? And then it doesn't stop there. We are saved to then... Do good things in our community to show off this mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. We are called not just to sit with faith, but to express it, to share it, to show it, to be in our people's lives and to simply do good things that bring glory to Jesus Christ. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Our good works that bring Jesus glory stems from that salvation We serve because we are saved. Now, it's not really our job to uh, invent these good works, but to discover what they are. Now, every single one in here has a different story. Your your past background, your passions, your experiences, uh, your education, your resources, whatever it could possibly be, your story is yours. I cannot replace you when you're gone. My giftedness is not your giftedness. When you're not here, we're less than a church. We are less healthy when you're not here. This is me not brown nosing. This isn't me sucking up. This is me saying strictly this. Your uniqueness that God created in advance for you to do good things can't be replaced. Can't be replaced by a staff member, by an elder, by some super volunteer that can do 12 things because you are specifically you. You are called by God, saved through grace in Jesus Christ so that you can do these incredible things that bring glory to him. And so when you're engaged, we're a healthier church. When you're engaged in your your acts of good deeds and of service to others, your family is in a much healthier place. When you're engaged, when you and I are engaged in our communities, our communities are healthier. They are stronger. And there are more people coming to a better understanding of Christ. So we see this in Ephesians 4. uh, Equip us people for works of service, right? The, The church is there to equip people. We're here together to equip people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. Now, this, this idea of works of service, uh, a little bit of study says about two-thirds of the New Testament usage of this term, uh, service, uh, really means a physical need. Right, So some of these things in the New Testament uh, it could be providing help to the hungry, the thirsty, the lonely, the naked, the sick, those that are in prison, delivering relief to those. Like We see so many times in the New Testament this idea of service or going, doing good deeds is to benefit others above ourselves, to show off the goodness of Jesus. And while we do this, it shows that we are maturing. When we do this, the body is being built up. When we are doing this, we are maturing in our faith. It's not just good input. Please hear me. The good input is very important, but without good deeds, we are not maturing. We are not growing. We might be a little stagnant in our faith. Even 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, and righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul shares with us the purpose or even perhaps the result of proper use of scripture, that it is for our knowledge and understanding to equip us to go out and do good things. It is not for us just to have a great amount of information about God, but to have that information so that we can be flexible and equipped to meet all the demands for every ministry opportunity we have as we interact with other 
people. Hebrews, author of Hebrews even says this. I'm just throwing this stuff at the wall. I'm hoping somebody gets it, right? Let us hold unwaveringly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Church, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you get to see and be a part of this, to see broken lives transformed and changed by Jesus. We are here to encourage one another. When people are blue and have a rough day or a rough week or a rough month or a rough decade, we're here to encourage one another to only this, or to go through this unwaveringly hope that we find in Jesus and it can spur one another on to these good deeds, that we can be loving people well, encouraging them, setting them up for success. That hope in Jesus should spur us on to do good in this troubled, troubled world. Now, good deeds or ministry can be defined as meeting another needs with the resources that God has given you. So this week, church, what has God given you? How have you been equipped? Uh, yes, the, the good information in, the good news in, that's good, right? Uh, coming to a personal understanding of, of Jesus Christ and, and fully relying on him and putting your faith in him is, is the best step that you could possibly take, but it's not your last step. How has God equipped you to meet others' needs through the resources he's given you? Through your personality, your experiences, your past, your neighbors, your in-laws. How has he equipped you to do good things, to show who God truly is. So church, my question is this. After you figure it out what God has given you, how do you you apply it? Do you look for another Bible study? I'll do a Bible study with go. Let's go. A cup of coffee at five o'clock in the morning. I won't be there, but maybe 7.30. It'll be good. We can read scripture, and then you know what? We can spur one another on to get into our communities, into our families, and into our workspaces and serve one another. That's my hope and my desire for you is that you, through the Holy Spirit, understand the resources that you've been given, the opportunity to fulfill the purpose that God has given you. So now that you've been saved, now you can go and do and serve others so that they can see the goodness of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we say thank you for the love that we have in Christ, the opportunity we have to read some scripture this morning. God, would you allow the Holy Spirit to do something in our hearts that you would transform us from people that are just excited about Jesus to be people that are worshiping Jesus in word and in deed, that we would be people that would go into our communities to spread the good news of a Savior that was willing to rescue his people while we serve them minister to their needs, to stand in the gap of pain with them. Father, would you do this on your behalf, not for the the reputation of Capital City or individually or families, but God, that your kingdom would be glorified, that we would be people pointing to Jesus as we serve one another. We say thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and let's continue to worship.
from the depths and the sorrow, Lord, to the greatest joys that we get to experience. You are there and you are good. God, thank you for that. As we go out and serve, Lord, I pray that we would remember your goodness, that we would remember that as we serve you, we are speaking your name, your powerful, powerful name, Lord. I pray for every single soul that is in this room today as they go out and as they speak your name to their neighbors, to their friends, to their loved ones, to their colleagues, Lord, to their friends, I pray, God, that you, your power would shine through the darkness that we all face and that your power would be glorified in the light too and in the joys that we get to experience together. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Amen. I pray that you all have a wonderful week and I can't wait to see you next week. See ya.